This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Today we have a special guest and we think you will find her story really sad and interesting. Um, we want to welcome Antonia Hernandez. I just want to thank you, Antonia, for being on our show today and coming and telling your story. Um, I understand that you had a really horrific experience with uh, Child Protective Services and your area. Can you tell us what county that you live in and where this took place? I actually live in Wayne County, but this happened in Otsego County. Okay. And. What started the investigation with your children? Um, Wayne decided to go camping for the summer. Um, we had the gas company has an easement through our property and they f called in a report of squatters on the land. So it's my understanding that this was land you were actually in the process of purchasing. Yes. So you were technically on the property that you would be owning. Yes, yes. So now, it, do you know why did they say why once they found out you were not squatters that you were actually purchasing the land, why they continued with their investigation? Um, they had a, four allegations that they made against us in court the next day that had nothing to do with whether we were on the property legally or not. They had by that time confirmed that we were in fact allowed to be on the property Okay. And what were the allegations that they were making against you and your husband as okay. parents? The first allegation was that we were living in tents and we had no financial means of support. The second allegation is that we had no electricity or running water. The third allegation is that my 15, almost 16 year old was babysitting the children and my youngest daughter, who was seven months old at the time, had a diaper rash. and. The next allegation is my daughter who's 17, who has CP, was cold. Okay. So, uh, were there any, I, I mean, were your children in fact being abused or neglected at that time? No, my children were perfectly safe. Actually, we had taken a lot of time and effort into making sure that we had all the proper things that we would need. And we actually, had everything that we needed, I would say. And if we didn't, we would, you know, of course adapt and purchase what we needed or, you know, do something different. Okay. Now, I'm aware that a lot of families take the summer and they go camping and that's a really healthy experience for children and they really enjoy that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be time at the lake or fun time and just, oh, yeah. you know, it can be a time to unplug in for mm -hmm. a family to really get close to each other. Right. So I just wanted to make that point that this camping is not something that has found, you know, has been found to be harmful to no. children. <laughs> yeah. So it, and we all know that because most of us have been camping ourselves right. with our children. Um. Now, you guys actually had. Um the appropriate things that you needed to keep the children and yourselves warm and yes 
and it's my understanding that you and your husband both have heating and cooling degrees. Yes, we do. So you would be able to ensure that it would be a good, you yeah, know, good, so good experience for the children that they wouldn't be too hot or too cold. Right, as much as anybody can and you can only take things as they come and make adjustments or change things if they're not working. But it is the assumption of CPS that you can't change anything and that if something's wrong then it's just going to be wrong and you're not going to do anything to fix it. Okay. I, I also, one of their allegations with that was that you did not have the means to support yourselves. Now, yeah. it's my understanding that your husband is one of America's finest, <laughs> has served in the military, yes. and we thank you for your service. That's definitely, you know, he's one of the ones out there fighting for the yeah. freedoms that we all enjoy. Yes. So he actually has military benefits, had honorable discharge, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, he, he served eight years in the Navy. He was actually down in Iraq and Kuwait during this last war. And he was honorably discharged. He served his time. And he's currently going to school in which he gets paid money to, for living expenses while going to school. It's part of the benefit okay. of being discharged honorably. Well, we're seeing that more and more, ladies and gentlemen, that the people that serve in our military that are fighting for the freedoms we all have are having issues with raising their own children. They're the last thing we should do, we should all be grateful for what they're doing rather than coming in and removing children that they love and care for. Um, this, I have noticed, is becoming a big issue among um, state organizations. So I just wanted to make everybody aware that this was an issue that you guys had and oh yeah, that it's hard for me just based on what he did for his country. Mm -hmm. um, now there's a really interesting twist in your case that many people don't have the luxury of having right. and that is that you are Native mm -hmm. American and so Basically, and if you're not aware of this, what that means is that um, Ms. Hernandez would be under the jurisdiction of tribal rather than state government. So this should have never taken place. And it's my understanding that right off the bat when this took place, you showed them your Native American identification. Yes. But so there was no question even before they removed the children that you no. should not have been under their jurisdiction. Right. And one all. of the actual one of the, one of the parts of that law is that the minute it becomes a possibility that the children are to be removed that they are to take active efforts to prevent the removal or break up of the Indian family and they did not do that. They gave us no other option other than the removal of the children on that day. Yeah. And another question I have for you um, did anybody who was overseeing your case, your, your caseworker or anybody in the court system, did they notify you that they did not actually have jurisdiction? No, nobody notified me of any of my rights under the law. They, so you had to go through and find this information out yourself? I did actually. I found the information on a website and I went and looked it up. It's actually a U.S. code. I went and to the you know the United U.S. Code, I went to their website and I looked up the law and how it did pertain to me and my family. Okay, this is another big issue that we're really seeing here because many parents that deal with family court or CPS are not aware of the rights they have, and the courts that are taking these children are certainly not making these parents aware of what their rights are. No. And I've come to the conclusion that if you don't know what your rights are in these types of situations, you have none. No. And that's not how, the, I don't believe for a second that this is what our found, you know, founding fathers right. had in mind um, for citizens of the United States of America. So this is a huge flaw in our system and we need, you know, most of the time people that find out what their rights are it's because they've already been affected from the system and as we dealt with this in, in this situation she had to go search herself and find out that she had rights that she wasn't aware of 
So this is a big issue in trying to maintain, you know, healthy, happy homes for our children. Right. Um, so they came in that day. Right. And removed the children immediately. Yeah, they stayed at the property about an hour and a half after we got back. So they were there about a half hour before we had came back. So altogether, they were probably there about two hours, and they were just looking around. They took pictures of our animals, of our tents, of our food, of our water, um, everything that we had there. And their claim is we have too much stuff for camping. <laughs> so, I mean, and then I asked them, well, if we didn't have this much stuff, then you guys would be complaining because we don't have ample food. We don't have a generator. We don't have water then that would be a problem. So Right, but that's all <laughs> stuff that you did have on the property. Right. And you did have a generator, you did have, right. you know, water. I understand um, you had, what was 30 gallons, 30 gallons of, of water? Potable water, which is drinkable water that we had bought at the store. And we were filling five gallon jugs at Walmart. You can fill them for under $2. And that was what we were drinking. We had been there a total of nine days when this occurred. So we hadn't even been there that long mm -hmm. and I explained to them that we were planning to stay the summer which would be my husband's semester summer and so we would be there approximately three months and that was if he did not get called back because he's donating a kidney to his mother so we might have been called back because they're in the process of testing and so he might have been called back in that time to do the surgery in which case we would have went home because the recovery would be done at home right so it sounds to me, you know, somebody who's abusing and neglecting their children is not going to give of themselves and donate an organ to a loved right. one. That's it. That is a big deal. That really speaks <laughs> volumes of, you know, you and your husband and what you're like. And I, you know, that's, that's a hard one for me to grasp because we've got so many people who are not caring for their children and you know, nobody steps in in these cases, children living in abuse, even being placed with abusers. Mm -hmm. And you've got people that are taking care of their children. And just wanted to touch base really quick that you have access to showers and to use restrooms and at a local place where you could, yeah. for hygiene of yourselves and the children. Yes. we had. A uh, small tub there for the children. The children obviously need to be bathed more than us adults because they get dirty. They're running around outside. They're playing, you know, what kids do when they're outside. Yeah. So they get dirty. So we had a little tub for them and we had a gas stove so we were able to heat water. And we also purchased a pass to the park where we could shower. And on site we had a composting toilet. So we were just using that. We'd used it before when we were there camping, but we had never been camping for even nine days there before. It's two, three, four days. So we had used it before. It was already set up there. It was already there. So that's what we're using for sanitation purposes. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about what, um, you didn't have a hearing before the children were removed. Is that accurate? Yes, we did not have a hearing. Okay, and when did the first hearing occur? It was the next day, and we went to that hearing, and it, I think it was at 1.30 in the afternoon. And at that time, at the first hearing, you, you can't speak. They tell you, you don't speak because you don't have a lawyer, and the other side gets to speak about the allegations that they've just given you a list of those allegations. So they get to speak and say, you know, well, your daughter has a diaper rash, <laughs> you know. You don't have electricity or running water, but there's plenty of water, Judge. There's plenty of food. You know, I, I did speak because I wanted to know, why are you keeping my children? Like, what is the grounds for keeping my children? And he said, well, we can't touch base on that. And I said, well, what about my 15-year-old? He's almost 16. How long do you plan on detaining him? And he said, well, I think you have the wrong word. I don't think you mean detain. And I didn't want to be rude, and I didn't say it. But I do mean detain. You're keeping him against his will, against my will. I'm right. his parent. You're detaining him. You're keeping him for no other reason than now you're telling me you want to keep the family together. So you're keeping him, you're telling me you're keeping him just for the simple fact of keeping him with his brothers and sisters. 
Right. But how is that more important than keeping it with his parents? Yeah. <laughs> that, and another thing that really angers me about this case is that you, and your children were in foster care for approximately one month. Is that accurate? Yeah, about a month. <clears throat> and one of your sons during the duration of time that they were camping or that they were in foster came, care, they were camping right. with the child. I did. I found out he was camping in a tent. You know, they had a hand pump for water. I don't find that any different than the water that we had available. And I just like, oh, well, apparently you're only allowed to go camping if you're in foster care. I don't know how that works. That, yeah, that, <laughs> that one really angered me. I mean, if, if camping is not an appropriate place to have children at for the summer, why is it okay for foster parents to take children camping? That makes absolutely no sense no, to me. No sense. And um, after I had got my CPS report back, it does state in there that there wasn't enough beds for the children. My daughter didn't have a crib. And that's true. She didn't. We practiced like co-sleeping and I was breastfeeding her at the time. So she slept with me. Yeah. She did that at home and she did that when we were camping. I Which is not against the law. <laughs> no, they like to say that, you know, it's really bad and you can't do it, but I don't see how they can tell you what you can do in your own home with your own baby. And and just to be clear for all the viewers out there, um, th this was not a newborn baby. This was a seven-month-old right. little girl. Right. Okay. Just want to make them aware that it's oh, not yeah. a, a newborn that you're going to roll over on or no. that type of thing. So can you tell me a little bit about your 17-year-old daughter? I understand she's a special needs. Right. And my daughter has CP. She got brain damage when she was three months old, which led to the CP. She ha she's pretty significantly disabled. She doesn't walk. She doesn't talk. She pretty much lays down is how she's most comfortable. She's not comfortable in her wheelchair. And so she pretty much just, she lays down and she's, no harder to take care of than a baby at that age who doesn't really move around. Right. You, she needs to eat and, you know, be changed. And that's pretty much the extent of the care that she needs. And, and her food and her, you know, drinking is all provided. Oh, she has a G-tube. And so she does eat via her G-tube. It's a tube in her stomach. And so the food goes directly into her stomach. And everyone that's old enough at our house knows how to do that and it's done via gravity which is another concern of cps but we have gravity when we were camping it was still there yeah so <laughs> you dump it in and it goes down so right. we weren't camping at a zero gravity camp so it was still possible to feed her and that she's way. being overseen by the care of a, a doctor and oh this yes is all oh yes she's been followed up her whole life and she's seen by a doctor you know pretty regularly okay. Now, it's my understanding that she was separated from her siblings she during was. the removal from the home. Yes. And what can you tell me about the care that she experienced while she was in foster care? Okay, well, she was placed with an older woman, and it seemed to us mm -hmm. that this person was not the most suitable caretaker for her it's due to her age, and my daughter's big, and she does need to be lifted and carried. Um, she also, her food got reduced by at least half. Her water got cut by uh, about a third. And so she did, you know, suffer. I don't know, suffer, but she did lose a little weight. I think she maybe got a little skinnier from the time she was gone. Now, was she overweight? No. Could she afford to lose weight? I mean, sometimes if... No, uh, she was not overweight. Her feeding and her weight has been strictly maintained at what it is now. So she doesn't get overweight because that would be a concern. What were her calories when she was in your care and you had a doctor overseeing her? Her calories were 2250. And when she was taken into foster care, they reduced her calories to 1300 based on a dietitian that the hospital that seen her that saw her one time okay and what and i understand her fluids were as her, well her uh, water was at 700 and they reduced it to 500 okay. so i'm not sure why that was done and 
any repercussions from it's from just, the decrease in fluid she, and she did suffer some stomach problems and I believe it was due to the massive fluid change she was used to getting a certain amount she's been getting that amount for a couple of years and all of a sudden it's cut in half I would imagine that she would have some problems she was suffered uh, constipation grouchiness you know due to her stomach so yeah she did have some problems and, and medically constipation can happen if you're not if your fluid intake is not high enough so this is right she a real concern especially for somebody who's totally dependent on you know those around them mm -hmm. um you know that has to be strictly maintained right. in order to keep your system working functionally and she we also all know that. is prone to constipation because of not being mobile and not being upright so she does that would be a major concern so what happened in your case is that you finally got to listen to them to listen to the fact that you're under tribal jurisdiction yes i found that out i went to the library i printed a whole bunch of papers and the first time i got to meet with my attorney i was handing him the papers and i was showing him the law and how this applied to me and from that moment it was still a battle I went and I cop I printed out the 2015 ICWA guidelines printed by the Bureau of Native Americans and I sent that to the guardian at litem. I sent that to m both of our attorneys and later that week the guardian at litem called me and he told me that my attorney was filing a motion to dismiss. He believes that the proper procedure was not followed and that the children need to be returned immediately. And that was the children's attorney who had previously not wanted to speak to me. But I made it very clear to him that my children were eligible for, for this law. And he said, well, you know, if the tribe wants to get involved, they can. And I said, well, if the tribe chooses not to get involved, they don't have to. But that doesn't negate their rights under this law. Yes. And so this is their right and you're their attorney. So, you know, you need to be fighting for their rights. And so legally, they had no right to remove the children. No. They had no right to give the children an attorney through the state. And they had no right to take any jurisdiction over your family based on the children's. Um, well, technically they can take jurisdiction, but they have to abide by the law as far as these rules are concerned. And that's the part they didn't do. They have placement preferences, which is supposed to happen in normal foster care. But here there's a strict rule and you have to go through every placement. They have to document that they tried to find relatives. They have to document that they tried to find someone in your tribe. And after all those prove unsuccessful, they have to get a, the judge to give a court order saying that they can place the children outside of this placement guidelines. That never happened. Okay. So it sounds like your children, they really failed them as right. far as... They refused to place them with our relatives. And we had people who could take them. So it didn't make any sense why they wouldn't let them go there. Right. Um, so the children were gone for about a month and then they returned them. They realized that they had made an error, did mm -hmm. not have jurisdiction. So kids, thank God, are back at home. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what do you think has changed as far as the children and what, uh, do you think that they have any they're feeling any different or um, are they having any behavior issues related to being you know inappropriately removed uh, they're scared they're scared of going to foster care they said they didn't like foster care they're scared somebody's gonna come take them they're scared when I leave they're scared when they're not around each other it, it's been really hard for them to adjust to they don't feel safe that's what right. it boils down to they don't feel safe with us and in our home that nobody feels safe yeah and and with children it can be very traumatizing being removed and placed with people that they don't know and um, not having any information mm -hmm. about why or what's taking place oh yeah and you're not allowed to tell them they won't let you tell them the truth I've always been honest with my children and I tell them the truth about everything I see no reason to sit here and you know play little games with them I would have just told them simply what was going on, but you're not allowed to, they don't let you. Right. 
<laughs> so did you have any communication with your children um, yes. during that time? Yes, we got three visits a week with the five that were in the same home and my special needs daughter, I got to see her once a week. The One of the main things is I was breastfeeding my daughter, so she was gone that period of time, so I was no longer able to breastfeed her, which I felt like was the healthy choice for her, you know. Right. And I was doing that, <laughs> but you know, being gone that long, I wasn't able to do that when she got home. And, and she was seven months old, and most doctors will recommend that you breastfeed a up baby to a year. at least until a yes. year. Yes, and that's what I was attempting to do. I breastfed all eight of my children, so I was trying to do what was best for her. Yeah, that's... So th they took that away from your daughter. Yeah, They really took that away from your daughter health-wise. Right. Um, so... <clears throat> they have been suffer suffering from some separation anxiety right. from you. Yes, and anytime we leave or go anywhere, they're crying and at the door, just like screaming. And they were never like that before. They were never scared. They were always very secure in in their home and in, in just being with us. Right. What I wanted to say is that mo many cases like this do not have a parent that has the type of immunity from the Native American society. And, you know, fortunately in your case, that was something that really saved yourself and your children a lot of grief. Yes. But how many parents are out there that do not have the, the safety and, and that, um, to be able to help the parents to keep them at home mm -hmm. and get them back to safety? So I imagine there's going to be some insecurity there because of what they went through and being removed from your care for yes. a month. The more I read about the Indian Child Welfare Act, it just seems to me that everyone should have these rights. You should have a right to an expert to come in and say what is specifically being done to cause imminent danger to your child. You shouldn't have the caseworker saying that. How does he know? We should have an actual expert or doctor saying what's going on. The, another part of the ICWA is when the emergency ends, the placement ends. That should be true in all cases. We shouldn't keep kids six months, a year, and, you know, the emergency's been over, and right. we're still keeping them. No, we should give them back and try to, you know, work in home to fix whatever the problem is. Yeah. And, and just want to let the public know real quick that this family is now afraid to go camping with their children, which right. anybody in your situation would be. I mean, that's just, oh my gosh, you know. Right. A family fun event that really turned into a horror story for Oh, it you. really did. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Antonia, for speaking out. There's a oh, lot yeah. of parents out there who are afraid to tell their story. They're still yeah. in crisis or have not got their children back. Yeah. Um, so we want to thank you for being oh, you're welcome. a part of our show and letting everybody know what took place in your situation. Oh, yeah.